versus Canada's participation in the military campaign in Iraq and Syria, but also its response domestically through Bill C-51 and the anti-terrorism legislation, in many ways demonstrates the connection that the government wants to make, which is between the ISIS threat and a Canadian military response. Other connections that are highlighted through that video but are consistently portrayed in both the media and by the government is a connection between ISIS and what's going on in Iraq and Syria with various um, developments within Canada, the targeting of um, military officers in Ottawa. The shootings in Ottawa in particular are highlighted as direct connections. Also, the inference to the Charlie Hebdo um, shootings are also directly connected. So what the government is doing then is linking these various elements together to present a coherent narrative of threat and to justify particular policy responses. But what's important to, to remember in this is as any securitizing actor presents a response as the appropriate response, they are, as Martin alluded to, they are presenting these policies as known solutions, as, um, as if they can demonstrate they know the outcome, that the proper way to respond is through a military response, and we know what the outcome will be. It will be a defeat of ISIS. Or we will implement anti-terrorism legislation, and we know what the response will be. It will prevent domestic acts of terror. Um, even though I would suggest the evidence suggests that both of those claims to knowledge are highly problematic. Well, I'll focus on the two in turn. Uh, the first is Canada's response in Iraq and Syria. And if you were reading the newspaper at all today, you will note that uh, another significant development and that Canada's foreign minister uh, has in essence announced um, an extension of Canada's mission. The original intention was that Canada would be participating until April, April 7th, uh, but today announced that they envision a much longer participation in Iraq and Syria. It is left undefined as to how long it will be, and Canada's role is also left undefined as to what exactly we will be doing there is not entirely clear. And as is demonstrated also by the video, that the only thing that we know is that a military response is needed and necessary according to this threat narrative. But what exactly the Canadian military is doing and how it will lead to security in the Middle East is not clearly enunciated. Right? It's simply, here's a threat, and here's the appropriate military response. Um, we know that currently um, there are 69 Canadian military uh, professionals in, uh, in Iraq and Syria, approximately 10 Canadian uh, planes of various sorts that are operating there, uh, doing bombing runs and also liaising with, with local actors uh, to bring about defeat uh, of ISIS. And some of the actors were engaging with, including some of the Kurdish uh, Peshmerga, but other actors on the ground. And without casting aspersions onto the actors that we're working with, because we, as Canadians, we actually don't know who we are working with, um, we've seen these types of interactions um, have negative effects previously. Um, we know that um, American interventions in certain areas involved working with actors that later on became Al-Qaeda, for instance. And so when you, when you have a military liaising with unknown actors that appear to be allies for at least temporary purposes, we don't know what that outcome will be. Despite assurances from the government that a military response is appropriate, the types of things we're doing, who we're working with, who we might be arming and training, um, I would suggest is beyond our knowledge to know what the eventual outcome of that will be. Um, but as, as Nicholson stated today, that will be ongoing. And um, the, the um, analogy that he drew is Canada's participation in Afghanistan which was about a 12-year commitment. So it looks like this will be a long-term commitment, um, but as yet undefined from our government. So we have the action in Iraq and Syria, but the other thing I want to focus on is the response within Canada, the second front of that war against ISIS, which is Bill C-51, the Anti-Terrorism Act, uh, which is currently before Parliament. And again, if you've been following the news and some of the controversy, you will know that this is, in fact, a highly controversial piece of legislation for what it does. Uh, it drastically expands the power of CSIS. 
and it changes the original mandate of CSIS, uh, giving it much greater power than it has previously. Um, and I can't go through the whole list, uh, we don't have time actually to go through all the things that are problematic in that piece of legislation. So I want to highlight a couple while I still have time. Um, the first is um, the creation of new crime against promoting terrorism, uh, which is largely left undefined beyond that, such that um, it's not clear what types of speech would actually entail inciting terrorism. Uh, you could have this type of a get-together um, where, where we might talk about people going to support the anti-ISIS forces on the ground, but it's not clear in this legislation whether that would qualify as inciting terror. If one were to encourage someone, let's say, to support the Kurds, for instance, well, in some, in some cases, Kurdish uh, groups are labeled as terrorists. And so again, you, would, you can get into, into difficulty when you have a piece of legislation that creates a very broad notion of a crime of inciting terror without clearly defining it in the way that it has. Um, the second problem is oversight of CSIS's new power. Um, the current oversight body in Canadian legislation is the Security Intelligence Review Committee. This is a committee that has been underfunded and whose funding has been cut progressively um, over the previous decade. It is understaffed and it no longer has the capacity already to deal with the various complaints that have been launched against CSIS. And now we are drastically increasing CSIS's power and their ability to violate the charter and certain laws at the same time as we are reducing uh, the one body that is empowered to actually oversee what CSIS is doing. And so we have this uh, potentially disastrous outcome where we have this expanded role for CSIS and no one overseeing it. And this has been the focus of some of the criticism of that piece of legislation. How do you assess the actual uh, threat posed by ISIS to Canada? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the difficulty, is that to, to, yeah, to, to take an approach that simply wants to examine how something is constructed as threatening doesn't necessarily answer, I think, the very important question of, well, then how should we respond? Um, a flippant way to respond is to retreat to an objective type position and say, let's just look at um, the objective factors, the objective things that will affect Canadians. And we know that in the next coming year, and in previous years, more Canadians will die from uh, moose, and <laughs> bee stings, and home improvement accidents, um, than, than will die from uh, terrorist incidents. And so one response has been, simply, well, let's just look at the causes of Canadian mortality. I think that's a flippant response and doesn't necessarily get at what is a real political issue, although it does put it in a nice juxtaposition to how we think about the things that we should be paying attention to. Um, so I think my response to that is simply to say um, it calls for a thoughtful, measured response that is not um, laden with security rhetoric, um, which requires us to engage with, as we're doing tonight, uh, the causes of what's going on there. Um, and, and how anti-terrorism legislation might affect Canadians within Canada. Um, it, it forces us to look at the regional context. It forces us to look at previous instances of intervention and the outcomes of those intervention. And while it might not necessarily tell us Canada should cease <laughs> operations there within the next two weeks, because I simply don't have those firm answers, I think it, it, it simply asks us to engage with a particular process of thinking about these questions and, and questioning those who would implement um, hastily and unexamined uh, policy responses in the name of security. And I'll leave it.